What happened to my friendships? 5 steps to navigate the social distancing crisis. Chapter 1, Part to Dot Our Most Essential Needs. It's no surprise that after basic physiological needs like breath, food, and water, safety is the next tier in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Then comes belonging and love. When I was in my early 30s, I engaged in a week-long experience at the Hoffman Institute in California with 30-some people of all ages. Before arriving, I got to fill out a long worksheet that listed hundreds of patterns that are present in individuals. This list included ideas, beliefs, ways of acting, values, and more. We had to identify if each was a trait we carried or did the opposite of. And which of our childhood parents and guardians also had that trait. Examples include, I am worthy. Love has conditions attached. Sex is shameful. Money is evil. These patterns were categorized into groups around love. Relationships, money, others, life, sex, spirituality, work, and so on. In this week, not only did we address how the patterns we learned in childhood formed our interactions with our whole life, but went through a process of release and forgiveness. People found that they were more loving of self and others after this week. And for many, it changed their ability to love and be loved in profound ways. But if, after survival needs, all we want as humans is safety, love, and belonging, then how do we get into such awful arguments and wars? Why is there abuse, hatred, racism, sexism, classism, and so on? How does the pure innocent love of a child turn into such a tormented and conflicted adult? This could be a whole book or three in itself, but let me share a couple examples of how these ruts get started. As a young adult, I started dating a guy who treated me pretty well. He was respectful and kind, and kept telling me how lucky he was to have me. You can imagine how shocked I was when we would go to his mom's house, and she would verbally abuse and berate him in front of me. She would tell him how awful he was as a man and how lucky he was to even have a girlfriend. Then she'd buddy up to me as if she was doing me a big favor. I hated being there and felt such heartbreak for him and the torment he had to go through his whole childhood and life. Fast forward a few years. He and I were living together, and when he got upset especially when he was drinking, he would berate me in the same pattern and tone as his mom. I could see the pain in him, knew where it came from, and basically rolled with it until the next day when he would be back to himself. I had no idea that it was wearing down my own self-esteem, nor could I see in the midst of it, that his abuse and manipulation was getting worse all the time. I was happy, had a career I loved, and knew I was strong enough to manage it all. He was diagnosed with manic depression and, when he was on his meds, everything was much better. Fast forward another few years. We were throwing a party at the house we owned together. There was food and wine and fires in both the fireplaces. Everyone was having a great time, and he and some others went out to the garage to smoke. In his drunken stupor, he couldn't get the door back open and assumed I'd locked them out. He started screaming at me from the garage, grabbed an axe, and chopped down the door while our friends watched in horror. I ran from the living room where more people stood frozen in shock and locked myself in a bedroom, grabbing stuff so I could climb out a window and leave. I could hear my friends trying to calm him down as he ranted about how he was going to kill me. WTF happened, how did I go from being in a loving relationship to one that was abusive and dangerous? I'm strong, intelligent, and independent. I didn't think I'd ever fall victim to something like that. Our beliefs. I feel like this is what has happened to our society, and in the next few chapters. I'm going to take you through further examples and some scientific background of how this manifested. First, I'd like to show how our cultural ruts started how, in our brains. Our perception of safety and belonging begin changing and how that amplified. I'll give some examples of how individuals carry fear and trauma and beliefs from childhood and generations past and how those susceptibilities created the perfect storm for Americans and other global citizens to become polarized, angry, and stubborn around their beliefs. So much so that we are willing to throw away friendships, turn our backs on our neighbors, lose our sense of curiosity and compassion and acceptance, and condemn ourselves 
to a generational shift into judgment, separation, and isolation. We have a bad day, become a bit ruder, a bit less accepting, but no one calls us out. The next day, we hear something on the news, we become afraid of what's happening politically or with the pandemic, and our brain changes. Emotion overrides our logical brain and eventually we cannot have conversations around conflicting ideas anymore. People start asking inappropriate questions about our life decisions and judge us if our decision is different, before even asking or knowing why we made the choice we did. Our beliefs start becoming part of our identity, the way we connect, and the way we evaluate others. We lose sight of the goodness in the world because we take our eyes off of it. Although many of our beliefs are formed from age 0 to 7 years old, there are other major factors that influence how we integrate information. Belief perseverance and confirmation bias are two of them. Let's explore what that means. Confirmation bias is the tendency to look for, interpret, and remember information according to your beliefs. Whereas belief perseverance is said to be a state, wherein a person refuses to change his beliefs even though his beliefs might be proven wrong. 17. In essence, confirmation bias is our natural tendency to look for information that supports the beliefs, values, or ideas we already hold. When the brain has familiarity with something, it recognizes that something more often. For example, after learning that you love to cook with shallots, you notice that they are in many dishes in the restaurants you frequent. Or you buy a certain type of car and then start noticing that make and model everywhere you go. But it can also be used in a less supportive manner, such as when the brain takes ambiguous information and interprets it to support its belief or desired outcome when, in fact, you were wrong to begin with. Fortunately, the use of critical thinking can help mitigate the effects of confirmation bias. As one analyzes information without bias or judgment, or at least tries to do so. Belief perseverance is a concept that highlights the tendency of people to hold on to their set beliefs, theories, and ideas even. Though there might be explicit, incriminating evidence that suggests otherwise. 18. I thought belief perseverance was just close-mindedness or stubbornness at first. As in, I didn't know it was a real brain thing. All I knew was that trying to change a friend's mind about something was challenging if not impossible. Unless we were both willing to be open-minded and unattached to the outcome. But it's actually a thing that was studied by researchers. So, I was excited to prove to my dad that I'm not so stubborn it's my brain. There are different types of belief perseverance, and it can function in both positive and negative ways. For example, if I know I'm really good at doing massage and a client comes in and doesn't click with the style or energy I bring to the session, it's not going to change my belief about my skills. However, if I believe I'm a good driver, but I am always getting into fender benders and collecting traffic tickets and still think I'm awesome at driving, well, there could be a problem with my belief not shifting until I choose to uplevel my driving skills. Belief perseverance can influence how we feel about ourselves. What we think about other people think about how first impressions are hard to break, and even what we believe about how the world works. Check this out. In a study conducted by Ross, Lepper, Strack, and Steinmetz, in 1977, subjects were asked to read to psychiatric case studies. In the first, the patient was said to have committed suicide after leaving the Navy. And in the second, the patient was said to have run for elective office. They were then asked to explain why the patient had acted in the way he did, and their answers were recorded. In both cases, the subjects were able to provide a befitting explanation, complete with proper reasoning for why these two incidents occurred. After this, they were debriefed that the patients had not really committed suicide or joined the elective office. They were then asked to give the probable outcome of these patients' lives. Interestingly, the subjects reiterated the same outcome as they had done before. In spite of being debriefed that no course of action about the patient's life was recorded. 19. 